Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, man. We've got a great guest today, one of the most talented guitarists out there, man. He's got a new record out, and he's just a, a very incredibly warm, nice human being. We're with the one and only Kim Mitchell, most well known for being with Max Webster in a very long solo career. A uh, couple of quick announcements. First, I want to thank our mutual friend, Rick Emmett, for connecting us. Rick, thanks very much. Second, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. And if you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button on your right or below me or something like that. And the bell, we appreciate that quickly. Kim's background, music veteran. He was a lead singer and guitarist for the band Max Webster. They released five uh, studio records before going on to a solo career where he's released eight solo records, including a new album coming out called the big fantasize. I have four tracks of the album. It is, absolutely devastating man i mean it, it's I, tr I think this is the best record he's ever put out and i'm not saying it because he's here and it, it's fucking amazing um it's his first album in 13 years uh the songs that i heard is the first single wishes and uh can I say the other songs i heard or not not yet sure absolutely oh, yeah okay he's got uh up to be down all we are which is an old hit of his oh my god it's a live version and he has other live versions but it's like when he's his solo on here, it's like, get ready for liftoff, man, because you're going on a trip. And uh, best I never had. Honestly, all four tracks, five stars in my book. Um, it's incredibly melodic song. The mixing on there is phenomenal, man. Were you involved in that, any of that? Uh, well, yeah, the recalls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they said yeah, I, I was it was being mixed in los angeles by greg wells mm. who produced the record um yeah. and and we can talk about him a little bit although talking about producers is kind of boring right <laughs> <laughs> but he's an ex-bandmate of yours isn't it greg he's play with you he, right greg greg wells who's now in los angeles has done uh you know a couple keith urban number one songs one republic apologized he did a lot of Katy perry records work with pink he had a song on adele's 21 record did uh, speaking of 21 so he did 21 Pilots' first record. He did OTEP. Uh, he did the soundtrack to uh, The Greatest Showman. Um, he he was born here in Canada. He was the son of a reverend. Uh, reverend wow. Well, we used, yeah, and at 17, he knocked on my door and and uh, said, I want to play in your band. Uh, and this is 17. I'm like, yeah, right, kid. How First of all, how did you find where I live? He goes, no, no, I want to play in your band. He seemed nice enough, so I gave him just a ridiculous audition. He was good. He would be a keyboard player, right? And so I gave him this audition where he had to play left hand bass and all these crazy ass chords uh, on a song called "City Girl." And I thought, okay, uh, I won't hear from him for a couple of weeks. And next day, he calls and goes, "Okay, I'm ready." And and we went to a room, and <laughs> he just he was just like blew me away. He had pocket. He had. I was like, how does a seventeen year old do this? He's got groove. He's got pocket. He's got attitude. So he was a pushy little prick the whole time. So I'm not surprised he did so well in L.A. He just has that. <laughs> right. Well, be, because because mo most of the time Canadians are apologetic, but <laughs> so, but he just kind of went down there with with not arrogance, but just being a pushy enough dude. And uh, so he's, he's done great. So he did the mixes. So he'd send me the mixes of the record. And I'd go, eh, that's a little piece. Uh, can you tweak that up? He was all about those little movements in the mix. Like, let's get this to where you love it. That's his whole attitude. Like, let's get this stuff to where you love it. It's phenomenal. The mix is absolutely great, man. And, and this is why I liked you the first time I spoke to you, man. You just like, boom, right out there. You don't get that a lot, which is refreshing. You know, you just say it how you, well, like, like there's not much of a filter there, man. I like that. I'm the same well, way. Would you like, okay, here comes the apologetic Canadian. <laughs> I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. Would you like me to put the filter in, Greg? <laughs> absolutely. Please do not put the filter in, man. Okay. Uh, there's a ton of energy on the tracks, and I'm really happy to turn everybody on to it. Uh, over his career, Kim's had seven singles in the top 20 in Canada. Somewhere in the middle of all this, he also spent a little over 10 years as an afternoon drive time host on Toronto Classic Rock Radio Station, Q107. And over the course of his career, he's been on the same live bill with acts like Sammy Hagar, Def Leppard. Black Sabbath, Aerosmith, and Van Halen. You seem so conservative compared to all these guys. Were you like that this laid back back in the day? I was sort of the 
shy, frostbitten Canadian backstage. Yeah. These, these guys are pretty badass, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but uh, they're also sweet. I always, always found that the bigger they were, the cooler they were. That's great it, it to was hear. A peop- it was a people that, in you mentioned my radio career. We had a, a act in once. They were a tribute band to Led Zeppelin. And the dude was like, I said, well, can you sing something? He goes, no, no, man, it's Tuesday. You know, I, I don't sing on Tuesday. And you know, <laughs> if, if, if you were a musician, you would, you would understand that. And, and my producer who was on the radio show, he goes, dude, he is a musician and he plays his own music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on. It's, it's so, Tuesday. There's, it's no Led Zeppelin on Tuesday. But, yeah, but I also I find that, that most of the people I've met are just real salt of the earth. It, yeah. yeah. Eddie wow. Van Halen and Sammy Hagar walked into the dressing room after a show and it was just he was I, of course I'm freaking out. I'm yeah. fanboying out, but because I'm meeting a legend. And by the way, a side note, I'm not dressed yet. I've just come off stage opening for them. And I'm sweaty and I'm just kind of in my underwear with a towel over your shoulder and I'm shaking Eddie's hand and and I, I'm pretty embarrassed, but it was a nice moment. It was just we we just hung out for 10, 15 minutes. Him and Sammy in the trailer with us, and and then later that day, well, there's a bit of a story. Should I tell it now? Yeah, man, definitely. Okay, of so it's a gig. It's a gig outside afternoon gig in, in Rochester, and there's just a ton of people in this. I'm not sure the name of the place, and and we're on the side of the stage, on Eddie's side. I'm standing with my sound man and my light man, and. There's a anvil case, a road case with Eddie's drinks on it at the side. So he'd run over and get drinks. And uh, he comes running over partway through the set, like four songs in. And, he, and, he, and we're standing there. And he, and he looks up at us. And he goes, he takes a big drink or something. I don't know what it was. He goes, oh, man, sounds like shit up here today. And my light man goes, points out at the sound man. And he goes, oh, yeah, you should hear it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you just say that to Eddie Van Halen. Van Halen kind of looks and kind of chuckled and kind of awkward and took off again. That's pretty funny. Guitar. That's great, man. Yeah, because it kind of didn't sound like ass that day. That's weird. But it was like an outdoor shed, though. Yeah, it was an outdoor shed. It's hard to get those things to sound good sometimes, man. That's great, man. Uh, Kim, this is he's going to apologize after this because I'm going to allow talk about his accolades he's a multi-platinum selling artist a juno award winner which if you guys don't know it's like the canadian grammys and he is being inducted or did this happen yet the canadian songwriters yeah it's gonna happen yeah when is that happening after covid it was supposed to happen and then covid hit so after COVID, so like <laughs> infinity so, <laughs> yeah my, my all that's not my that's not my first almost moment craig there's a couple others <laughs> <laughs> after covid he's being inducted into the canadian song and this is he's the canadian songwriters hall of fame and this is the best quote i read this that you said it's a compliment this is like i wish i had so first of all, let's set this up by who's yeah. in there. There's people that, that your audience will know. Uh, Neil Young, Joni yep. Mitchell, uh, Leonard Cohen, um, Gordon Lightfoot, who's more of a Canadian. But these, yep. these are older, vintage artists, legendary. So, anyway, so it's, it's, a, it's a big honor. And uh, it is. Uh, Kim's comment, I, I, I've got to somehow get a plaque because, you know, once every like once a month at least i get an amazing cool quote like this that i wish i could just like look at and chuckle this was what kim said it's a compliment to be associated with such a group of dysfunctional songwriters i feel i am just as dysfunctional as they are touche man that that was I'm going to fit right in. <laughs> yeah, that was perfect, well, man. That was, aren't we all? I mean, that was great. Well, it, we are as, as well as maybe the human race, but musicians, uh, though that list of people, they've had their stuff. And yeah. I said that because you know, the kind of people I, I, and I kind of say this in a light way, in a humorous way, but the people, you know, in your life, they're like, Hey, Hey, how are you? They're always, engaged they're looking at you everything you say and they're reacting and they're <laughs> happy and and when something kicks them in the crotch they're like oh well you know stuff like that happens in life they're happy all the time they're in tribute bands they're, <laughs> they're not 
<laughs> they're not songwriters. Right? Yeah. Because they're happy. And I'm not saying we can't, we're not happy, but I think songwriters are a little more dysfunctional in relationships. They've had addictions. They've had all kinds of stuff happening. But that's, that's been the fuel for their music, which I think is part of the mojo that makes it more relatable to everybody. Does that, yeah, that make sense? Okay. I, I think it, it makes total sense. It was spot on. I think creatives in general tend to be a little more sensitive and a little more reflective and want to take that sense, the energy from that and fuel it into their creative projects. A hundred percent, man. Sure. And I'm not, I'm not slamming uh, people who are happy who are in tribute bands. Cause I play. <laughs> you I, bastards. I, <laughs> fucking happy. Yeah, bastards. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I want to be happy too. <laughs> um, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. You're hilarious. And uh, thanks, thanks I'm so happy. Hang, the record is wonderful. Um, all right. So if I read this correctly, you were playing in a band called zoom, like Z with three O's M. But then after high school, you left the band and went to the Greek islands. Now, how fun does that sound like for a high school kid to be hanging out? You know, especially right now, we're all in the middle of COVID. You can't go across the street. Um, what prompted that trip? What did you get out of it? And what made you come back? Okay, so uh, after Zoom, at 17 years old, you quit home, you quit school, you moved to the big city of Toronto, Canada. It was three hours away from your hometown you grew up. We, the band did really well in Toronto. We were young kids. We did great, but we had to break up when the weather got warm because our fridge was out back of the house. And the <laughs> landlord, I, mean, I swear, it's true. This, this the, is the best landlord breakup would not, excuse would not, ever. <laughs> would not, it's true. The, the landlord would not fix the fridge. So everybody went, well, okay, we can't really feed ourselves anymore. So we're going to move back to our hometown. And I went back and I was ready to go back to school. And a friend of a friend caught out my phone number and went, do you want to come on the road with a show band? And I was like, what's a show band? I, I don't know. What is that? And he says, well, you work Monday to Saturday and you do three sets a night and we'll pay you 150 bucks a week. And it's a Greek singer and a female singer. And we're the backup band and we wear suits, sparkly stuff. And we do this thing, this Tom Jones thing. Oh my God. Like, that's awesome. So, well, that's what I said. I was, I've been in a tribute band. I was a, um, so I was like, I'm down. I'm, let's go. Let's go. And then about a year into that, I was really enjoying it because it's steady cash and you're playing every night. You get to practice during the day. Um, he says, my family's building a nightclub in Greece on the Greek island of Rhodes. You guys want to come? So we went over there. And it was just like one of the most beautiful times of my life. Um, I stopped smoking. Uh, I just lived really clean. The food over there is great. You're on a Greek island. Um, playing music every night. There was no break, so it was seven days a week. But uh, it was it was fantastic. And during the day, I'd practice. I had a Gretsch Nashville that my, my dad bought me, this orange Gretsch Nashville, and just practice every day in, in my room. And the biggest decision of the day would be, am I going to turn left or am I going to turn right? And it was just a fantastic time of my life. And, and, um, and then you were saying, so that's, that's what took me there. I loved it, but then I wanted to start because I was practicing. I thought I want to get a guitar teacher. And so I knew that I had to go back to Canada and got the name of a private teacher who had a really good reputation. His name was Tony Braden. Um, he's no longer here anymore, but um, I made plans to meet up with another musician in Windsor who ended up being in Max Webster. Uh, we, that's how we started Max Webster. And it was a jam we started, and it was the most awkward jam ever. It was like one of those jams where you go, ooh, ooh, that, <laughs> that really wasn't happening. Um, but we decided to give it a go and keep, keep, keep at it. Um, so I went to move to Toronto. We moved to Toronto to start Max Webster. And Max Webster was literally uh, a bit of a revenue stream, so to speak, for me yeah. to take lessons from this guy for a year. And that lasted a year because... Um, did a little over a year because Max Webster started to do really well. And I just was getting so busy with the band and writing and recording and traveling that I couldn't keep up with the, the practice thing. You've done all that. You did all the writing with Mac Web Max Webster, correct? Uh, well, I did. And with another guy, Terry Watkinson, who was a keyboard player, he contributed the stuff that was actually really successful uh, here in Canada. He was sort of a couple radio hits and stuff like sure. that. And I was sort of the wacky dude that, 
Um, you know, I grew up on Captain Beefheart and stuff like that. There's so, a lot of that in in the Max Webster catalog, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a little, okay, you can hear that. Actually, well, it's <laughs> funny, Greg, Greg Wells, working with Greg Wells on this record in Los Angeles, he's been there 20 years, and the first time I said, he said something, and I went, oh, I'm sorry, Greg, I could have done that better. He goes, and he's Canadian, he goes, let me be the apologetic Canadian <laughs> while we make this record. But he said, there really is a difference. Canadians are very much like that. He said, if that, it was over a guitar solo. I said, I'm really sorry, I could have done that better. He goes, if you were an American, you would have gone. And he said, it's great. He goes, listen to that, man. You're not going to hear anything better than that. It's amazing. Look at, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> the like, I can't, can't relate to talking like that. That's cool, you know? No, it would. It, it, if it was most musicians, they would have said, "God, I fucked that up. Let me do it again." That you know, yep. that's probably what yep. they would have said. Sure. Yeah, it, it'd be yep. the real, the rare sort of arrogant asshole that sure. would say that. But but you might hear that for sure, man. Easy. We, it, it's a fine line, though, Craig. Being a musician, though, you kind of have to walk with that confidence, and I call it cock. You have to walk with a lot of cock, and sometimes it, it gets perceived as being arrogant. And um, but you need to have that confidence to do what what we do right I think, so. I think it gives other people comfort too you know imagine going to the doctor and he's like oh my god i think it's the red tube i gotta put in there <laughs> exactly. you'd be like you know you, you know i so i think that's comforting you know you, you like i've been in shows where i feel like where there's a really capable leader i feel like i'm in good hands and yeah. then i've been in other shows where the guy's a wreck and it's like this is not working, you know? So I, I think you need that in any profession, you know, to, to uh, succeed. Yeah. Man. Yeah. All right. So what, so you came back to Canada for Mac, what, Max yeah. Webster, once you got back, yeah. um, what were some of the challenges early on with getting Max Webster launched? Uh, we had to do cover tunes and stuff like that to get work. Uh, That's just the way it was. There was a really healthy bar scene around Toronto. There would be a dozen places to play. And then, from there, there were high schools we could still play in, but we had to play stuff that people knew. So we sort of, that was kind of the challenge to get work to, to play your suffrage at City by David Bowie and stuff like that. And, but we were writing and, 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 uh, and doing our own stuff too, a little bit. Uh, what I loved about that time, so that's kind of the challenges. Every, every, I, it seemed like a pretty sweet time of a new band growing and starting to gain popularity. And the more, more popular we started to get, the more original stuff. And the more original stuff we started to do, a beautiful thing happened as more people came as opposed to like, yeah, yeah, they're doing their own stuff. It's like, wow, no, that's amazing. This, this is amazing. So uh, it was, that was a cool time to be able to, to be, a, be doing your own stuff. So. And, and this next question, I, I know you've been asked this a hundred times and I apologize in all advance, right. That's right. That's but right. I, this is the only question I, I hope that I'll, that you'll have been asked a bunch of times. Um, obviously at a certain point you came to the conclusion that the band had run its course. Was there like a straw that broke the camel's back or, because I think that takes a lot of, you know, courage to be honest with you to, to disassemble any, you know, whether it's a marriage, a band, you know, that's together that long and you've got a lot invested in it. Yeah. Um, I don't, wouldn't say there was one straw or, or something. It, we were, we were uh, opening up for Rush a lot and we were managed by the same people and Rush were becoming quite famous. And the attention was solely on Rush. At, at, you know, and so we were kind of getting left in the dust, I felt. And I was kind of creatively burned out and just wanting to come off the road. Plus, I was having a couple of personal problems with uh, uh, my lady back at home, who ended up being my wife and, and uh, uh, mother of my two wonderful boys. So I thought, OK, it was in Memphis. And I just went, that's enough. Um, but it, and it, was, it was right at a time where I think Max Webster was kind of on the verge of of we we were headlining the odd show, but I think that was just going to break open real soon. We were going to head over to the Hammersmith Odeon and do our own show in, in England and a couple places in Germany and stuff like that. And throughout the States, we had some cities where we could go in and, and headline sort of small theater. And, uh, so that it was right on the verge of that, but I pulled the plug and I just wanted to go home and write. Good for you, man. I think that, like I said, I think that's not an easy thing to do. 
No, no, it's not. Um, and, and we had great times in Max. I mean, we did Battle Scar with, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I just said it. What everyone says, hey, I like when you did Battle Scar with Rush. No, Rush did Battle Scar with us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you were kind enough to send me some like funny or interesting talking points, so I wanted to go over some of them. Sure. Uh, riding in a yellow Volkswagen Beetle with Joe Walsh in Memphis to find out if he would produce your Rockland record. That's right. Um, the label kind of went, you know, we were looking for a producer at the time, and the label went, you know, maybe Joe Walsh should do this. He's kind of looking for a project. And so we went, yeah, sure. And then he kind of forgot about it. And the phone rings one night at home and my wife picks up the phone. She goes, there's a really weird guy on the phone and he's asking for you. <laughs> I said, okay, what's his name? She goes, Joe somebody. And I said, ask him if it's, his last name is Walsh. She said, yes, Joe Walsh. So I said, ask him. I get on the phone and all Joe said to me was, hey, you want to make a record? I went, sure. He goes, all right, let's make a record. And he hung up. That's all he said. Um, and then the label arranged everything like, okay, Joe wants to meet with you at his studio in Memphis and blah, 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 blah. So you get to the airport and there's Joe and his bud and they're going to take me to the Peabody Hotel and they put me in a presidential suite and everything. I'm not used to this kind of treatment. But I'm, I'm jazzed because I'm Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh, yeah. bar, Barnstorm and fan, like, man, what a groovy guitar player dude. So we're walking out and all of a sudden we walk up to his friend's yellow Volkswagen. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And there's guitars in the back. Like, <laughs> so I'm like, I said, uh, what? and they said, and Joe goes, you're going to sit in the middle. <laughs> so have you ever in tried the front? to sit in the middle? <laughs> have you ever tried to sit on the, the stick the shift? Moment? What the hell? Yeah, that's exactly. So Joe's on the passenger side. That, and we're like, like this. It's like shoulders mushed together, gear shift going on in between my crotch. And that was my fantastic ride with joe walsh to to the peabody hotel and then to his studio and we went over the demos for a few hours and everything he said was just so genius and so like oh man this is so great but he was having trouble also with a girlfriend i think i think it was a chick and, and he kept leaving the studio so he kept getting distracted and this was happening for four hours and finally i just went Dude, you, you seem like you're having a lot of trouble with this person. So I'm just going to go back to the hotel and I'll grab the next flight. If you want to continue this at some point, um, let's do it. And he said, okay. So that's what happened. And then uh, spool ahead a couple of decades later and opening up for him. And he's at the catering table picking away at, you know, some ham and some crackers or whatever. He's looking down at the foot and went, Joe, I said, do you remember blah, 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 blah. And, and he looks up at me, goes, no. <laughs> I was crushed. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, he's and, and he probably. Goes, and he's, yeah, he said those were crazy times. Yeah. And I was so I was so strung out and burned out. And and then he stops, and then he goes, so how are you anyway? And I was like, it's okay. You don't, you don't have to make small talk. Man. You're at the catering table. Have a great show. Yeah. That was very uh, smart. How old were you then when you did that? Rockland. I don't know what year was that. Some of the eighties. So um, I don't know how old was I. Thirties, forties, forties, some thirties, forties. That that was pretty um pretty mature to do that. Cause like a, you what? know, what to just say, hey man, this doesn't seem like it's a fit right now. Just I'm gonna go back home and. But I mean that was the right thing to do. But like you know, you're a young kid. And you got Joe Walsh. It would it was very tempting to probably sit and say. Oh, let me make this work somehow. Oh, but you, I'll put up with this. But no, he was he was very distracted. He kept leaving the studio. Yeah. And I felt for him because he seemed really troubled. Yeah. Every time he came back, and I was like, oh, man, it's okay. Like, you know, so, yeah. It was that was cool day. of you to do that. All right, Gene Simmons quote. <laughs> okay. Not a shy Canadian. Uh, about why Max Webster never opened up for Kiss. Sure, I, I, got, I got to ask him once. I said, Gene, why didn't Max Webster open up for Kiss? And he said, because you guys could play. That's what he said. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, that's Gene. That's, that's, him being, that's him being nice. That's him being showbiz. He's, he's got lines for everything. So I know deep down inside, we both know 
you're hugely famous and successful and and it doesn't matter where you are in the spectrum of musicianship or where I am. It it is what it is, but thank you for saying that. That made me laugh. So. Yeah, that was very uh tactful of him. And I mean, a lot of times, you know, Craig, I didn't know that any of these people even knew who I was. I saw Paul Stanley come off an elevator once in Canada here and and somebody said, Oh, Paul, this is Kim Mitchell. And he goes, Oh, Kim Mitchell, go for soda. I love your work. And so like, what? And so wow. Crazy freaked me out the same thing with neil sean and we're doing a gig with journey and at the crew meal um i'm kind of looking at my band going hey he's like right over there i want to go say hi to him like introduce myself because i'm such a fan of his playing and his writing and um, he owns his own piece of musical real estate and all that jazz and and my drummer went he probably knows who you are and i'm like, I'm like no he doesn't he goes well then go say hi and exactly the same time i stood up he stood up and he came over like kim mitchell nice to meet you man i really love your work and i was like and my drummer's going, see, I told you. That's so cool. That's nice, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's what I'm talking about. These people are so nice most of the time, right? Yeah, that's really cool, man. All right. <laughs> As a Black Sabbath fan, I want to hear this one. Being invited into a Black Sabbath playback of a tune they were recording, as well as the scariest gig opening up for them. Right. Okay. So Black Sabbath were in Toronto, Canada doing some recording. And I don't even, I can't even remember the album. All I know is we were in the middle of our record, Max Webster record, Meet Me Up My Sleep. And we were doing overdubs and they were in the main studio. And Ozzy was in the lounge. I kept seeing Ozzy in the lounge. And he was, I think his father was sick and mm -hmm. maybe even dying at that point. So uh, see, he was just in the lounge, always on the phone and kind of the TV was on. And, so I didn't spend, we didn't spend a lot of time sitting in there. didn't want to sort, of, sort of leave him alone. And then uh, Tony Omi walks over to our studio and went, hey, nice to meet you guys here. We just cut something. You want to come in and have a listen? I'm like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, sure. And there we were in the main studio and they had just cut this track. I can't, honestly, I can't remember the details because my mind was kind of blown at the time. And like, hey, here, sit here. You know, in the middle, you sit here in the middle. And they just cranked the piss out of it. And I just got lambasted with a brand new, fresh Black Sabbath tune. I was just like freaking out. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Did you get to talk yeah. about Naomi? Uh, just a, a little bit. But, I, you know, sometimes these, these moments are, it's like going really fast on a motorcycle. Like you can't, you don't really remember a lot about it other than you were there and it happened. And, um, so I can't remember what we said. It was the same thing meeting Mick Jagger. I was like, talked with him for like five minutes. I was like, well, what did you talk about? I, like, I can't remember. He was just saying he had meetings in Toronto and stuff like that. But um, that was a nice moment. And then we opened up for them in Leeds. Oh. Leeds. And it was, first of all, the gig scary just because it, was, it looked like an underground parking lot. And it was like a low roof and everything is concrete. And, I'm kind of standing backstage as they open the doors and the scariest audience just starts running towards the stage. That moment of where they open the doors like, ah! and, and, and I'm just looking, I, I haven't seen people like this in my life. I'm from Canada. And there's, like, <laughs> there's like chains and hair sticking up and, you know, things, you know, written on them. And I'm like, Oh my God. And, and I, I started to freak out. And I went back in the dressing room and I went, man, they're going to kill us. We're, we're going to get eaten alive here. We're just like frostbitten Canadian. This, this is going to be, this is going to, well, I don't know. Well, I, well, we might not even get out of here. And we ended up going over great. We went up there and, you know, you're terrified in the yeah. first two, but we thought that we came out with Hangover or something uh, off the first album. And it was just kind of riffing away and rocking out. And they were all of a sudden like, okay, we'll put up with this for 30 minutes. You know? And it was cool. And, and, yeah, it ended up being cool. Sometimes not so cool. I got bullets thrown at me in Detroit, um, in Chicago. It, the gig went rough, but uh, what happened? Have money. Uh, in Chicago or Detroit? You pick. Okay, Detroit. Yeah, it was uh, we were the first band. We were the first rock band to play Joe Louis Arena, and because it was opening up for Rush, and uh, that's so we were, that's tough, man. That's a that's a tough to open up for a band that popular, man. That's. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like opening well, it up for ACDC. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. It's it's uh, it's tough. Anyway, so we did it, and and 
in between songs, the lights would go out, and I kept feeling things bouncing off my chest, off my head, my face. My, I hear a thing like, bang, on the guitar. Finally, I looked down, and there's like bullets at my feet. They were throwing so, bullets at you? Yeah, some, some dude was throwing bullets, which reminds me of Alice Cooper in the chicken story. He told me, he said, who brings a chicken to a gig? It's like, <laughs> have you got the tickets? Have you got this? Have you got the chicken? Got okay, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so Bud's leaving. Bud's leaving. Hey, so we got our tickets? Great. Okay, we got a bus ticket there. Yeah, great. And we got the bullets for the opening act that we're going to throw it. Yes. Yeah. You know, no, I, you know what, man? You're right. I often think, like, what? how does that thought, where does that originate, man? Like, how did that fucking creep into your mind? Like, I'll bring bullets with me to throw at the opening. You know, you really wonder like what's going on inside someone's head. Like, how does that originate? <laughs> how do you tie going yeah. to a concert to bringing bullets, right? Or a chicken? Yeah. 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 But the thing is we, we went over good in front of Rush. We, we, we used to do well in front of them because as popular as they were and were getting, we sort of had our opening act trip down. Okay. And Neil Peart, every night Neil Peart would play with us. That was his warm up. He scrimmed his drums. And he said, do you mind if I play your set? So every night he'd play our set without his mics turned on, obviously. But so on stage, we had two drummers, the whole set. That's and wild. It sounded great. And it was, sounded great. And Neil would be warming up and the audience just thought, oh, it's back stuff, so we couldn't hear it. So. That's really cool, man. Yeah, yeah. That's my big memory of Neil. Um, moving to the back of a club. Am I babbling Alan. too much? First, first of all, Craig, am I babbling too much? So you can edit some of this stuff. No, man, you, this is great. Okay. I, no, no, no. If I was okay. hanging out with you, this is a conversation that I'd want to have. Okay. okay. No, man, this is great. Okay. I mean, you're okay. the you're the guest on the show. People want to hear about you, <laughs> okay. not me. You know, okay. I don't have okay. any concert Sorry. stories. Sorry about babbling. <laughs> <laughs> My concert stories with Joe Walsh and Black Sabbath are not as good as yours. Um, okay. uh, moving to the moving from the. <laughs> spitting all over the place like i'm tw like i'm two uh moving from the front row to the back of a club while watching alan holdsworth play okay so music is about transmitting energy and, and being moved yeah and and alan i just remember sitting in, a, in front it was i think it was a club in the states or england I, i'm in that detail i can't because i saw uh i saw him in england too on a night off and i remember my feet could literally touch the stage. It was two feet and I was kind of just off to his right. So I heard the PA, the PA was right there and sort of off access to his amplifier speaker. And I was a fan already and I'm just sitting there watching him and it just got so musically intense. He, he just, that guy was just his cording stretching, you know, seven frets and his, his, his legato, four finger legato stuff, not three, four fingers. And, and just what he was playing, I was like, what is going on here? Like as a musician, I wasn't comprehend. I mean, it was a beautiful feeling. It's just like, you have that, you always have that thing in your head going on as a musician. How, how can I play that? How did, what's he doing? What mode? What is, and I couldn't figure any of it out. So I was just like letting it wash over him. I was like, and then he started just into this chord solo thing. The band kind of stopped and he was doing those chord swells with delays. And I got, I got freaked out. I kind of got overwhelmed, freaked out, started to get anxious. I went, I got to move. This is just too intense. I can't handle this one more minute. Wow. So I got up, I got up and I moved to the back to sort of like catch my breath. And I was like, <sighs> I was like, give me a shot of something. Yeah. A shot of whiskey. And she had to chill out because it just, it was the first time music just, kind of frightened me it was so intense have you had something like that happen again with anybody no. else that was pretty cool hun that yeah, was pretty yeah. cool there man wow yeah. that's awesome yeah. man um this is funny when you choked and you couldn't play in a james labrie session <laughs> james labrie is the singer of dream theater with yeah. john petrucci the guitarist of dream theater sitting on a couch in the control room that's right. So it's up in Canada. It's out. James has this studio set up in, in a cottage on a beach up here. It's summer. It's beautiful. It's like, he said, hey, man, I've got a cottage. You know, I'm doing a solo record. Come on up and play on it. And he says, I want you to do one of your like, slow melodic solos like you play in All We Are. I'll send you the track. And I kind of heard the track a little bit. I'm like, okay, I think I can do this. Yeah, I've tried a couple things. I went, okay, pack up. Up you go. As soon as I walk in the place, there's 
Petrucci sitting on a couch in the back, and I'm like, all right. I'm like, uh, what, I'm like, what what am I doing here? Like, he can play. What what why did he ask me? He goes, Oh man, because you you know how to he says, I don't want that speed. He looks back at Petrucci, goes, I don't want what he can do. He's like shredding away. He says, I want you to do your thing. So I'm like, okay. And I rolled off about six takes and and couldn't get to the end of the solo. I just nothing was working and it just i could tell the vibe from the couch was like what's this dude doing here whoa whoa i can do this and i choked and i just went i looked at the producer james up up at the board and i just went you know man it's okay i'm, I'm kind of choking here um i didn't didn't i didn't say anything about petrucci because but that's really what was happening i was just too nervous and too uh uptight to play so I, I bailed. I just went, I'm just, you know, go ahead. You know, maybe, maybe some other time. But thanks, thanks for the offer. It's good. Man, they, just, they took took the check and just gave it back to him. And oh, the you did? The 300 bucks or whatever. I yeah, know, yeah. Like session three. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to take it. No, that was cool of you to do that, though. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Man, that was good of you to, like, just say, hey, um, this is not. Well, what I don't wasn't think, happening? Yeah, but I don't think people do that enough. I mean, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say this doesn't work. Yep. And 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 people are very sometimes afraid to do that. Like you did with the um you know, uh when we talked about earlier. Um with, here's, with here's the band. The deal, with, with, yeah. Yeah, here's the deal is in music, when you're adding instruments, you have to be adding something. And not only was I not at, I knew right away I wasn't adding anything and I was making it worse by freaking out. Part of my brain was like, that's John Petrucci back on the back couch there. And maybe he was sitting there going, well, this guy's pretty good, but I, I'm, you know, I'm a Canadian. Not, I don't know. He thinks I'm, I suck. And this is so I just, I was sweating. I just got out of there. If it, if you're sweating, that's just not even a good vibe to be in. No, no, no. It was like, no. Luckily, there was a beach close by, so I probably could have jumped in the water, but I didn't. I just got in the car and like, start the car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why recording eleven to five, like daytime hours, works better than burning the midnight lamp? Okay, that was something I learned from my producer of the last record, Greg Wells, who. You know, I said, so, yeah, we have your studio. I'm only down here a week right now until I'm ready to go from 10 in the morning till 2 in the morning if you want. He goes, no, no, we'll work from 11 till 6. He says, it will be a better record. And he was right. He said, yeah, at 6 o'clock, you're going to go for dinner. I'm going to go home, and you're going to walk around Culver City uh, and enjoy California, and I'll see you in the morning, and things will be better. And he was right. That's right. It, it's a it's a work ethic that I had, have adopted since that. You know, you, as musicians, you we've all spent the time learning our craft. Where you, know, you get up out of bed at nine thirty, ten o'clock, and at eleven o'clock at night, you're still in your underwear. You haven't eaten, and you feel like something crawled inside your mouth and died. But and it's like, whoa, okay, that's okay. But if you're making a record, uh, it just works better. To Interesting. Shorter, shorter hours. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned about musician hours. Uh, when I first started the show, I shut my. I don't take calls after like eight o'clock because I just I want a life, right? But um, my phone would ring like eleven or twelve o'clock at night. I was like, "Who's calling him?" I'm like, "Oh, it's a musician." She goes, "What's wrong with these guys? Why do they call you so late?" I'm like, "You probably just woke up." <laughs> yeah yep. you know he's he, and he doesn't know that i'm on the east coast he's probably in la or whatever and yeah sure yeah, yeah, yeah totally yeah i get yeah. that we we have our our yeah our weird hours that's for sure man it's, it is what it is man it, yep yep it's okay what would you tell oh i'm gonna ask you this one because uh beatles record you only have one beatles record rubber soul yeah yeah this is me when i was a kid living in sarnia ontario Sarnia, Ontario was across, Sarnia, Ontario, Canada was right across, it was a border town, right across from Port Huron, Michigan. Port Huron, Michigan mm -hmm. was 40 minutes from Detroit. I was raised on Detroit rock and roll and Motown. And Motown just resonated with me as a young kid. 
I remember being like 10 and 11 years old with a little transistor radio and you're, you, it's only in mono. So you have one earpiece and listening to Motown. And those were the records I wanted to buy and wanted my parents to buy. And so I got to buy Four Tops and Supremes and Temptations. And all my friends had Beatles records. And like, <laughs> hey, man, come on over here, Sergeant Pepper. And there's just Rubber Soul. I had one Beatles record. And it was Rubber Soul. And I, I think it was just be, there's some sort of cohesiveness or flow to that record that I really enjoyed. But I really, the you know, Sergeant Pepper and all that stuff, all those concept records, mm. I really got turned off by for some reason, you know. Um, and, and there were great songs on it, but um, the idea of a concept record was something I, I, I'm not sure why. I just kind of like, yeah, I don't want to listen to a concept record. Plus, all my friends had the Beatles records, so if I wanted to hear anything, I would walk across town to go hear it. But the only one I remember going across town to actually do that to was when my a bass player friend of mine went, Hey man, I just picked up live at Leeds by the who do you want to call oh, it? I was like, yeah, great. Record, I'm, walk, I'm, I'm walking over. That thing just plowed me right under. It's still one of the best live yeah. records ever. I, I think they finally released the whole concert, which I'm sure you know already because the record only had like four or five songs on it. And yeah, uh, yeah. It, it was too way too short. What a great, oh, that's oh. power in a bottle, man. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'd rather listen to that than Old oh, Blood D, Old oh, Blood Dog. That, you awesome. know what? I got to tell there's you. Nothing, and there's nothing wrong with that stuff. It's, um, there's two, yeah, okay, go ahead. You were going to say. Uh, I'm, you know, always people say Stones or Beatles. I take the Stones every time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, same with you and Billy, you and Billy Gibbons. Yeah, I, I, I'm you? just not. I, I mean, the Beatles songs are nice, but they never like moved me, mm -hmm. you know, so I understand exactly. Yeah. And, and there's, there's two kinds of hip sway. I, I find there's a side to side hip sway, you know, that. <laughs> oh, blah, dee, oh, blah, da, like, uh, and that's okay. That, there's music that that works for, but then there's the front to back hip sway. It's that, you know, dun, 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 <laughs> that pulse and, I found Motown music did that to me. And yeah. uh, the, the other stuff did, of course, a lot of great rock and roll came out of Detroit. It still does. MC5. I, as a kid, I opened up for the MC5. Oh, did you? What was what were those guys, yeah, yeah. guys like? Oh, man. Oh, man. I, I had something <laughs> profound happen to me during that show. First of all, later, let's spool ahead first. Uh, I got to tell little Steven this. He was on my radio show once. And I, and I said, yeah, he, he mentioned something about the MC5. And I just offhand went, yeah, yeah, I opened up for them when I was like 15. And, and he stopped and went, did you just say you opened up for the MC5? And I went, like, yeah, yeah, in Ann Arbor. And he goes, man, your cred just went, went up. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, we opened up for them in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, the National Guard was around. And we all shared the same dressing room. And I remember going over to Brother Wayne Kramer, kind of all shy. And like, he was changing the strings on a Stratocaster. And, and I said, uh, you know, the goofy nerd question. So how often do you change your string? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like, I was like uh, walking up to a woman, right? Going, you come here often? It's like, yeah. It's like, you know, like, you know, yeah, uh, like, where'd you get that you blouse? Went, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh. So, and he goes, and, and meanwhile, the, his, the MC5 stompers were with him. No, not many people knew about these. They were the, these ladies who looked after the band, made their clothes, they were the girlfriends and they, they were the band called them the MC five stompers because anybody who tried to get into the camp, their, their little thing did stomp them out. Um, and so anyway, he was really nice. He said, I, I change them every, every show. And I said, Oh, I said, that's, that's, I said, you, why would that be? And he, well, he says, I slammed the piss out of my guitar. That's why I did it all. <laughs> He said, I will, I will break strings the second and third show. I know that. And I said, okay. And that, this is a profound moment, Craig. I watched them. And by the third song, his guitar, and I hope I word this right, was so beautiful, beautiful and sweetly out of tune. I went, there's nothing sweeter sounding than a Stratocaster out of tune. <laughs> and it's the only it's the only instrument to me that can be out of tune and still like go oh it's so amazing as a matter of fact i like a stratocaster kind of out of tune more than i like a really in tune stratocaster 
That's great. Does that make any man. sense? Yeah, yeah, sure, man. If so it, whatever kind of a, floats your boat, if something makes, yeah. you know, there is no, to me, man, there's no, yeah. I, I don't think there's making sense in anything, whether it's music or religion. If someone, if, if you like it, great, man, good. If it makes you feel good, fuck, wonderful. Yeah, you know? yeah like some of that old Hendrix stuff where he's live and he's playing out of tune. It's like, I don't mean the Star Spangled Banner, but, you know, some of the stuff is like, whoa, whoa, whoa that G is like, I just it sounds so great to me. It's just bigger and more expressive and it's just, it's a man it's like oozing with mojo to me yeah it's funny if you listen to um jazz cats though those guys are super sensitive to that yeah sure yeah they're 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 very they're they have much less tolerance of that than uh well in canada craig um you don't play jazz you commit jazz you commit. It's, a, it's a yeah it's a it's an offense here <laughs> that's an offense that's great you know, i think he still has the mc5 stompers because i got referred to wayne and oh yeah yeah to come on the show and he wanted to come on he goes oh you should oh he, man. he said call my wife and i called her she never returned my call twice so i think the stompers oh. are still there man <laughs> yeah yeah so that Maybe was he that. married married one. Oh man I'd love yeah. to have him on. Yeah, it'd be an interesting oh, story. Oh, that would be so cool, man. So cool. Yeah. His book just came out a while ago. You know, I was going to read the yeah. book. All geared up for it. And, you know, so oh, man. I'm not going anywhere. I'm sure it'll come around. The most explosive thing ever. They just exploded on the stage. It's rare you see that these days. It's just like, you know, not a big light show. There's no big production. It was just like, wow. And, oh, man, it was amazing. I get chills <laughs> thinking about it. Well, that's a good segue to the next question, yeah. and it's a tough question. Top three experiences you've had musically. So we're talking about things I've, I saw? Uh, things I've you seen, saw, or... things you participated in, things you were a part of. <laughs> um, Whatever, you like just, knee-jerk well, reaction. Okay, well, sure, knee-jerk reaction would be just jams that, those, those moments where, where you deeply connect with the musicians you're playing with. I think that's what we're all after as musicians um that's that's the thing that's going to give us the most satisfaction and you can get that in a garage with a case of beer you can get that on a stage in front of twenty thousand people the, the, the dude who has his band um in the garage uh and then they connect musically that's the exact same feeling as a celine dion or a u2 or a, a kim mitchell or a rush are feeling when they connect the only thing different is the numbers so my first thing would be when that happens and that happens often uh i'd have to say alan holdsworth in there that night was where i got scared that was a, a crazy ass moment um uh, seeing anna natrebko a russian opera singer at the met in new york city i was a fan of hers i was turned on by a girlfriend's family and I just fell in love with her talent and her mojo as there's, there's opera. And then there's, there's Anna de Trubko. She's like in a different stratosphere when she walks out in the presence and the voice and how she expresses it. Um, just, yeah. It, like that. Well, there's been well, concerts along the way too, but uh, I haven't really done a lot of studio work with people. So I can't say, Oh, when I did this with such and such. So. Sure. You know, every time I played on somebody's record, my part was buried, so I just stopped doing it. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the if the jams that you had with others that come to mind? Tell me one um, of those. Well, okay, okay. So it was the drummer of Max Webster. Um, him and I booked a him and I booked a, a little place, a friend's cottage who had some gear in it, and we said, Let's go out for the afternoon. And we went out there and we had a jam. We started jamming, just him and I, no bass, nothing. We just freewheeling ready to go okay here we go and we it got so deep and we enjoyed it it lasted about maybe 10 minutes and we we're supposed to be there all afternoon when we stopped even the way it ended and fizzled out we were kind of connected and right down to the last little same thing we went that was pretty amazing i really enjoyed that and he was like yeah i yeah. have so what do you want to do and he said i don't want to do any more let's just go home I went, okay, so after 10 minutes, we're going to be there in the afternoon. And this, I, this is one of the moments I'm talking about when you really connect. And it was, that was a beautiful moment I remember in my life. And it's funny how you remember those moments, that they stay there, those, 
those intense musical moments. Yeah, that's great. Any, any other one that comes to mind? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Just sometimes all we are, you know, I'm playing the solo and it's just a, a nice feeling. Uh, it's an incredible like playing, playing solo, that solo. I, I, I just sort of let it go and, and, uh, and it's a slow song. It's not, I'm not shredding in it. I'm just, it's just, uh, floating. I, I love serving the song. I love serving songs. It's, um, you know, I love schooled players. Uh, I won't mention their names, but the guys who are really, really efficient and textbook incredible. Um, and yet they'll serve the song. Yeah. So some don't. Some of them are like, look what six grand at GIT gets you. We look what this is. <laughs> okay. Great. No, it's know, great, music, man. Music, music becomes a, a vehicle for them to do their thing over, which is fine. They've paid money for it. They've worked on it. And it's valid. I love listening to that. But I also love when someone just serves a song, like a Doyle Bromhall. Yeah, the second he's one of my favorite guitar players because he just he just play he serves his song. It's like he's so greasy and there's so much mojo and it's like you have to do that if you if you're if you're if it's a song you got to serve the song. You got to take whatever you know and do what's right. You know who else said that is Tom Bukovec. Yeah, you know Tom Bukovec, that name Nashville yeah. session player. He's like yeah. you know I listen to these cats. They all have their he, he talks about this. He's, I have, have, you know, they all have their own headphone mix they can dial in. He says, I'll listen to some of the other cats mix. And he said, they got the vocal way down because they're coming up with these cool parts and playing these neat things. He says, man, I just crank the vocal. He says, and everything I play is a reaction to the vocal. And that's probably why he gets called all the time. Yeah. Because he's, ser yeah. he's serving, he's serving what the song is about. I think that's important. Hey man, I think you're going to come into money. I saw you scratching your, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I am scratching. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I think my that hand. means you're going to come into There's, money. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. No. Does it? Okay. It does. You call me one week from today. The cards okay. don't what, lie. <laughs> what do you want? I remember, <laughs> what did I say? A, a drummer I just had playing something. Greg Morrow. He's a Nashville. Dude. I know Greg. He was on my show. He's a, he, everybody loves that. Yeah. He's the busiest motherfucker in the world. Every, he yeah, was, he was out with Seeger from Detroit. I mean, he's, yeah, I, yeah. we had dinner. He was in Toronto with Seeger. <clears throat> he's on my album itch. That's him playing drums on that. That's, and, uh, was, he's yeah. playing on everything, man. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I say he's on uh, a song two up to be down on this album. I said, I said, Greg, what do you want to do it? And he goes, everything you have plus 30%. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. He's such a cool guy. He's so, so humble and so melt. Like he's the most yeah. unsuspecting, like you'd never know what a rock star that guy is, man. No, you would never guess that he is a musician at all, other than he has a bit of hair. And, yeah. You know, and, that's fun. Yeah. I'm going to make a note, man. I'll send you that interview because it was really nice. He's he's a very nice guy. We had a nice conversation. He, he's a really good he, he's, he's a dude that serves the song, too, right? He just yeah. oh, counts it in, pocket. It's all about the service. That's great. Man, it's a small yeah. world, even up in Canada. Yeah. It's a, that's yeah. wild. Um, yeah. I want to talk about the new record, the big fantasize. What prompted you to do a, a, and thanks for sharing all our stories. Those are very cool, man. Thank you. Um, what prompted you to do a record after 13 years? And do you think that that big gap is maybe responsible for the record being so great? You know, kind of like how the first record you do is so great in that mm -hmm. sense. Interesting point of view you have there, Craig, about that. Um, it was 13 years for sure. I was doing some writing and, I uh, was just happy just as a dancer wants to dance, a painter wants to paint. I was happy just to write and have nothing ever happen to it. I was, I was okay with that. And it wasn't until Greg Wells um, visited me after a health scare and on his way back to Los Angeles, I gave him the USB key of shame. I had my demos. <laughs> you got your demos on the USB key of shame. Greg, before you leave. Yeah, you don't bring it up. He's like springing on him the last minute. Hey, Greg, I know you're a really successful big shot down there in Los Angeles now. Here's my key of shame with demos on it. If you can give me any feedback on even one tune as a songwriter, it would really help me. And then he 
emailed me a couple of weeks later and went, I love this stuff. Like, I love every song. Please come to Los <laughs> Angeles and let's record it at my studio. And uh, he said, this is a side of you that hasn't been exposed enough to your fans. So let's let's do this. I'm down. I'm thinking, wow, Greg Wells' the studio where all those people record. And he's, he's been there 20 years getting specialized gear to make his sound. And all this stuff that he does, I think, sounds fantastic. He's great ears. He's an amazing drummer, incredible bass player, beyond in a, into a different stratosphere, keyboard player, piano player. And an amazing guitar player too. He used to pick up the guitar when he was in my band and get all jealous in the dressing room. Be like, how do you, how are you doing that, young little seventeen-year-old? <laughs> Part time. So he, yeah. yeah. So he said. So he said, "Yep, yeah, let's do it." So I, with a bit of hesitation, because taking do an album, another album is a lot of work, and I would have to finance it myself and everything. And so, but I went, "Yeah, okay, let's go, let's go." What made you, what, what timing was right, right for you? What was, you know, what was it about the thing that just like you got jazzed about it? Well, it was, first of all, it was Greg saying this stuff. It, you know, you, as a songwriter and you've done your demos, you're like, hey, man, I really like this stuff. But a lot of times people are like, yeah, okay. But Greg was like, oh, I love this. this. This part here, this song here, this chorus, man, some of this stuff is strong, strong. It's like, you write this stuff so so great. Like, let's, come on, let's let's get it out. Let's do it. So that's the moment yeah. that I went, okay. I'm so, glad and you as did. Far as what makes, what makes it so great, I, I don't know. I, you know, Craig, thank you for saying that. But all I can say, the, the process for me, because Greg said this, he says, Dude, let's just get this to where you love it. I, I want to get the songs to where you love them, and if you love them, I'm gonna love it. So that's all we did, and we cut the bed tracks pretty quick, um, and then I came home and finished it. That's so. It's an, it's a great record, man. I'm I'm Thank happy you. that you did that. Happy for you, and happy for me that I get to listen. Thank you. I'm really proud of it. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. Thank man, you. that's really nice to hear you say that because I know as a Canadian, that's not something that you probably want to say. No, it's really, it's, that's a good feeling, man. That that you could say that. It that's is. great. It is. It is because uh, you know what what was nice about it is, and I hate to bring Greg's name up again, but. First of all, I'm in California. I love being in California. I find it to be a creative hot zone. Anytime I've been there, I just I feel creative, and the whole city is about that. And and second, um, Greg Wells is is producing it, and he's engineering it, and he's playing on it. So right away, I can drop my shoulders and go. I don't have to worry about how this is going to sound. I just have to perform. I just need, and he's going to get the best out of me because I'm going to be inspired what everything is sounding like. Yeah. And, and it was a real nice song and dance between the two of us. One day there was a moment that, that he taught me to a kind of a profound moment where he went, I made a suggestion about a song and he went, and he got kind of pissed. And I was like, what? He goes, that doesn't sound like you talking. That sounds like outside chatter from some, somewhere. And he was right. It was, it was from a, a manager. Like, so he's like, yeah, yeah, maybe we should do this and do that. And, He's just like, if you if you, you want to make this record yourself and listen to that chatter, he says, but when we're in here, you and I working, that's who's in here working. I don't want to hear any record company chatter, uh, girlfriend chatter, spouse chatter. He says, it's you and I. And I was like, okay. And, and that threw him for a loop. He, he kind of called the session for the day. He goes, you go and think about that because I don't want to be involved if that's going to be happening. And I came back the next day and I apologized. I went, I apologize. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I said, would expect I said, nothing else. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, yeah. Hey man, I'm shocked. I have the hotel for five more days. I've got to make the best of this. <laughs> so I said, no. And I realized he was right though. He was right. You know, I said, yeah, you're right. It was, it was somebody from the outside. It's not going to happen again. Let's go. That's cool that A, you had someone that knew you so well over such a long period of time to know what's you and what's not. Cause man, that is such an, like, I know I'm thinking of my relationship with my wife. We can, we, we've been together so long and we know we can call each other on bullshit and it really helps, yep. you know, and that you trusted him so much 
that yeah man that's you well, know well be beyond that too craig think about it in musical terms that how many bands and stuff making records did listen to record companies and yeah. listen to outside and and it, it made for a worse product like just i'm a believer get the producer and the band in there the right producer and the right band and just let them do their thing same thing with the cover on my record it was like oh well shit, blah 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 i was like this guy's done cover after cover here here's some some elements let him do his thing let's yeah. just shut up and let him deliver let the let pros people do, do it. Yeah. Let yeah. Let let them do what they're doing. No, I'm a firm. Like I wouldn't. If a guy came to fix my roof, I'm not up on the roof with him saying, "Hey, man, yeah. don't yeah. you think you should approach <laughs> that hole a different way?" I mean, no, no, I believe yeah, exactly. that. Let experts do what yep. they do, man. I totally yep. believe that. Yep. Um, talk about the first single, "Wishes," man. It is a beautiful track, but I and I've read the backstory, but people probably haven't heard it. It's a really nice story. If you could share that. Sure. Um, well, I, I'm kind of a believer that all these, these ideas are floating around in the stratosphere and they pick us as conduits to bring them to life. I know there's some musicians, uh, Bob Dylan has said that, you know, he doesn't write it. The song kind of just tells him what to do. And I'm, I, I kind of feel like that. Um, and so one day, 10 years ago, I'm in a waiting room and as opposed to picking up an outdated Reader's Digest, something was telling me to pick up this book of poetry, what I ne which I never do. And I picked it up and I opened it up and I saw a poem. First thing I saw was this poem called Wishes by A.C. Child. And a. at the end what? of it, A.C. Child. Okay. Like Great. a children. Yep. A.C. Child. And by the end of it, I was kind of filling up because I just loved the, the, the poem about yeah, we can wish for beauty, we can wish for wealth, we can wish for all this stuff, and that's fine. Um, there's other simple things we can wish for, too. And this is some of the things that lists, and hopefully these, some of these you get before you die. And I was just kind of like, wow. that was So I wanted to write a song around it. I ordered the book, and I, obviously Amazon wasn't around 10 years ago. I don't think, I can't re remember how the book got to my house. But once it came, I wrote it, the verses pretty quick. And then went, uh-oh, now that it's a song, it doesn't feel complete. This poem is a poem felt so, just reading it. Now, now the challenge is, how do I, how do I finish the song? Because it's not finished. I feel like it needs a musical deviation. It needs a, a refrain, a chorus or something. <clears throat> that process took 10 years. Um, every few months, I'd, I'd come at it. and It's almost like the song went, no, that's not at all what I'm looking for. Yeah, you're right come back a few months later. No, that's not it. And this went on for years and years until the album was being recorded and almost, you know, I was in the final stages and wanted to put it on. And I got to, I was playing it right just over here, a couple of feet away from where I'm speaking to you in my living room. And I, I got to the part where first part where I thought was awkward, something had to happen different. And I just stopped playing guitar and I closed my eyes and I, kept, I sort of sang a little melody it felt natural and it was like the song like yes yes that's it more like that more like you're on to it like stick more of that more of that and in an hour and a half uh i had the thing finished the the musical section in the middle and, and it was like it all fit it all sounded like it belonged it didn't sound like here's a piece stuck in here to be stuck in it was like no this this is all a complete song now and it was like the song, the song went after so many years okay man you did it finally it took you a bit of time, but you did it. Thank you. You go that way. I'm going this way. <laughs> <laughs> That's is he is he alive? AC Child or is he or she or is it a he or she? I've tried to find out. We don't know. We only know it's public domain. So um, interesting. I've tried to find. So if anyone knows, um, yeah, we're 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 trying to. We're still researching that. We've gone to the publisher of the book and everything. So That's I'm cool. hoping eventually, eventually we'll uncover something man well it's a beautiful song i think it was written in the 40s it's 40s. a beautiful um thank you is, is that the longest relationship you've had with a song it's the longest i've had a relationship with anyone anything <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> drummers five years that's it <laughs> longest i've had a relationship with anything <laughs> that was perfect man I don't know uh, my guitar, man. It's been been around me forever and comforted me through everything. So. 
Well, we'll talk about that in one minute. Um, All We Are, that's a live version of a song off your first solo record, Akimbo Alongo. You've Kimbo done Alongo. this. What's that? What's that? Akimbo Alongo. A logo. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, you've done this live before, but this live version is pretty special. Do you, any reason why you think it is? Um, it, the song morphed into something else it, from the studio record. We played it. And then when the band members would change, keyboard players would change it would morph into something else. And I always kept throughout the years. I love doing that. Letting, letting the band sort of the input of the band and just let things kind of, go off in a different land and just all of a sudden I felt like it was landing in a different place again so we were doing a, a live show for a radio broadcast and we played it and I thought let's record this show so well it was a radio broadcast of course so we um and at the end of it I was like oh I like what's happening here so I sent it to Greg and I said would you want to mix this so he mixed the stuff and so that's it's so pretty happened. man it's so Thanks, freaking man. cool god it's so, so, so that's part of, of the, that's part of the, the record, the big fantasize, which, which will be coming out. Um, it, it, there's nine studio tracks and four live tracks. That's a beefy record, man. 13 tracks. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's awesome. And then I just want to, people like it. Uh, if, if this is reflective, I don't see how it can't be liked. Uh, best I never had the whole vibe of that song is so cool. It's got a great groove. You got a, acoustic electric on there the drums are killer on that song and again i just thought yeah. that you, the mixing was phenomenal any what's the backstory of that one well um remember uh writing it i loved the lyric i saw the lyric first by a dude i was writing with and i loved it, the opening line manhattan had a satin smile reflected upon your face and there's a couple sexy lines in there uh the sweetness of your lips on mine, the taste of loving you. And I just, I, the few lines in the lyric, I just, and then I just started writing with a drop D tuning and, and sent it over to him. And he, and, and he said, the guy who wrote the lyrics, I was like, he was like, I, my wife and I stopped in our track. He says, the opening line with the way you said, a man, 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 I said, he's just like, whoa, stop. And we played it. So right from the beginning of that song, it kind of was, hit the ground running and and it was a special song to me and and greg played drums on it oh so that's greg wells playing drums in la dude and, that was the drums know, are I'm playing, killer on yeah, there i know i'm playing i'm playing i'm playing the opening riff and then i'm like okay here come the drums and greg just comes in with this doo, 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 doo. i was just like oh my god this, he just read read everything so well on that song it's beautiful it's funny that uh, I met. Wa yeah. Watching him play drums to that track was one of the most incredible experiences I, I've seen. Because, you know, there we were in his studio and it was just like so grooved and so sitting in the pocket. Yeah, well, the groove on that on that whole song was wonderful, man. Really cool. Thanks, man. Um, what were some low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and, and how'd you get through them? Okay. Uh, you're talking about in my life? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. My marriage ended, my mom died and my career kind of hit the dirt uh, around the nineties. Uh, guitar solos had gone away and I was sort of riding a bit of a crest and then it just, the bottom dropped out. So um, all three of those things happened at once and I fell into a, a dark place. I was on medication for a couple of years and moved out of, moved out of the house and went up to a, a, a town a couple hours north of Toronto, Canada, um, on the water, and just started to, to try and heal. Uh, was a, it's a long struggle, but one of the big moments for me was my father one day went, you know what you have to do to start feeling better? And I'm like, what? He goes, get up and make your bed every day and do a good job of it. And I started laughing at him right there. I was like, <laughs> yeah, but I, I get up and I make my bed. And he goes, no, do it and do a good job of it. And that was sort of the beginning of, of a healing thing for me, as, as weird as that sounds. Get up and do something for yourself and do a really good job of it every day. And it slowly started to pull me out of the, of the slump. So during that time, um, 
I also did an album that was called Kimosabi, and it's it's kind of a depressing record. It didn't do anything, but I somehow got it out. And, uh, so it was a dark time for me, a couple of years up there. But oddly enough, now I look back at that that time in my life, and I almost want to move back there because uh, it was such a place of growth. Yeah. You know, I, I stopped drinking. I stopped doing. I was running. I was going to the gym, and you know, doing everything you you have to do to pull yourself out. And one day it lifted. I, I found out that I couldn't do the medication anymore. When my physician it sent me into a arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, and the doctor went, "You can't take these meds anymore because this stuff causes atrial fibrillation." Blah blah blah. blah. He says, "You're just going to have to." pull yourself out of this by thinking positive thoughts. And, and that's what I did. And every day I tried to find two, three times a day where I think something really positive about the world, my life, earth. And, and one day I just went, whoosh, whatever the depression was, the chemical imbalance, I felt it in over a 24 hour period, just go, just lift and it's never returned. So, Man. I'm lucky. Thank first of all, thank you for sharing that. That was really cool. Well, you. there's a lot of people yeah. who go through that, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's should it should be. Uh, I'm not going to say it. No, it's a, it should be a normalized conversation. It really should be. I agree but, with you, a hundred percent. Don't man. don't hide that stuff. And I told people, you know, I'm not feeling good. You know, told doctors, and it's the first place to start, and because they'll help you. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that, um, first of all, I'm sorry for all, all that shit that happened. Sorry for your loss of your mom. That's, uh, I had one period like that in my life where I had like five things happen. You know, you, even if you're a pretty strong person, you could pretty much handle, but when you have like, you had three things, multiple, multiple, it, that's yeah. kind of fucking heavy, man. It's like, yeah. You're you're only here. So you've been through it. You're saying you've been through it. So in by yeah. more environmental causes, right? It was nothing of my own. I mean, you know, I was in. I I always try to look. First thing I do when I have shit going on, me personally, I always look for what's my involvement because if I could find something I did to participate, a okay, lesson learned. Don't fucking do that again. But B, I don't feel like as much of a victim. I don't like yeah. feeling like you know. Yep. Well, so in some of these things that would happen, I, I were involved, but some of them was just environmental. Like I had nothing to do with any yep. of them, you know? That's right. That's right. And it was just like, but when you get like three of them like that at once, it's, it's hard to deal with, man. It's. Yeah. Well, you know, you need it's you okay need, to, yeah. it, it's okay to have a pity party a little bit though. It's okay. You're, you're, you're somebody dies around you that you love your mother. So it's yeah, okay that's pity. like, like literally own it, man. It's like, yeah, I feel fucking terrible. Yeah. You know? And, uh, so yeah. Anyway. Thanks man. Um, it's funny yeah. you mentioned the bed. There's been a bunch of articles here about how important that is. Cause I don't know about your kids. My, none of my kids make their bed and let me tell you, it would be a cold day in hell if I got out of and did not make our bed or if my wife, I mean, it's just like, it's like yeah. brushing your teeth. It's just, but yeah. they, uh, the articles basically talk about what that does for you is what your dad said you do. It's like you tick off, Hey, I started my day doing something good. I accomplished yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, I may not be feeling well right now, but I'm going to start every day off right. doing something that's right for, it's just, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because when you feel like shit, making your bed may be all you fucking can do for that day. Exactly. exactly. But you did Rather it, than, you yeah. know, but you did because it. Because you, you, when you're not feeling good, you're going to get out and you don't give a shit. You're not going to wash it. You're not going to do anything. You're going right. to walk away and go sit on the couch and you know, whatever. It's like not good. Yeah. Yeah. Your energy's low. It's funny. Cause I, I, I'm constantly on my kids, like make your fucking bed. I mean, they're all adults <laughs> now. I don't, I can't say it anymore. Cause they, two of them don't even live here. I can't go, like, go into their house and say, Hey, do you, oh. but they don't. Oh dude, dude, my son's my old, I have two sons. My oldest son's my road manager and he owns his own place. And you go over to his place, he'll pick out a paper towel and you go, he'll go like, wipe off a baseboard i'm like what are you doing he's going i see some dust and dirt over here when he comes over here he sleeps in the basement it's like shambles fucking just like a mess because we're flying somewhere next day and i live close to the airport i go downstairs when i come home it's like 
what the fuck happened down here? It's just like he cleaned it up. What a guy! Um, no, no, he doesn't. He oh, doesn't he doesn't clean it up. Oh, he does. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking bedding everywhere, juice can. He went in the fridge and there's. Oh, and your house, he doesn't out. even make. Oh, oh see, man, I would. He doesn't give. It doesn't give a shit. It's I'd be like, horrified if I stayed at someone's <laughs> house and I didn't make the bed, put the fucking silverware away, wash the cups. I'm like, it's someone else's house. I'm even more amplified. Joe Joe, Joe Perry uh, told me a story too. Uh, where I interviewed him in radio, and he says, "Yeah, I live in a compound a little bit." And he goes, "We built a house down the street from on the compound for my son." He says, and we have to call when we're going to visit our son. It's like, hey, you, can we come down for an hour? You know, I mean, have a drink or something, or, you know, whatever. And it's like, yeah, okay. But the son, they'll be like watching TV and just the door swings open and the son comes in, heads to, heads to the refrigerator and unannounced, uninvited, you know. Yeah, that wouldn't work. I don't care if my kid comes in, but that, that would work. Yeah. It would be reciprocal. It wouldn't be like, oh, well, we got one rule for you, another rule for, for us. Yeah. That, that ain't happening, man. Thanks again for sharing that. I appreciate it, man. I'm glad everything's okay now, man. Your dad sounds like an awesome guy, by the way. Yeah, he was, he was just a pipe fitter and a welder and uh, wanted me to go to school. And uh, when I quit piano, I took piano for a while. And when I quit, he just said, don't ever say to me, I wish you would have. He says, don't ever do that. I said, okay, yeah, yeah, shit, I hate piano. I, and <laughs> lo, lo and behold, a dozen years later, I'm like, you know, Dad, I wish you. He says, no, no. no, no. <laughs> uh, that's cool, man. He lived, he lived to 95, man. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. I have a funny feeling of your answer based on your former comment. Tell me what your go-to guitar is right now. Has this changed over the years? And what other two guitars would round out your top three? Sure. Uh, my go-to guitar live is uh, a Bill Nash S63 Strat with yeah. Lawler pickups in it. Um, the thing just has a nice mid-range bark to it. It's a 10-inch radius neck. Um, I'm not a huge fan of relic guitars, but I've got one and this thing just feels great. It, it's on the road. It, it's fine. It moves around a bit, you know, because of the lack of finish on it. So the neck moves around a bit. I also have a James Tyler yeah. classic, which is a Strat. I love that guitar too. So that's my second go-to Strat. Um, and I'm in the middle of, of getting a custom shop Fender Strat. I also have a go-to acoustic right here. I'm not sure even what it is. It's from the 60s, and it oh, has no wow. bottom. And uh, I just, just have this in the house all the time, in the living room, and pick it up here and there. I'm not sure what model it is. It's just a bit smaller body, but there's something about the carve on the Gibson neck that feels comfortable. And that, those are my go-to guitars. You you were always a Strat guy. Pretty much, I do have a Les Paul, um, and then I had a blue guitar that was sort of a a body and a neck, and it was all the parts of a Gibson three. Remember three thirty fives with a coil tap. What were they called? Three forty five. Three forty five. So three it's okay. three forty five, three fifty five, something like that. Okay. One so had a, three, depending upon if it was semi hollow or ho all hollow. Okay. Oh, okay. So anyway, it was it had the coil tap, and I loved that, but I didn't like the guitar, so I ripped everything out and put it in a drawer. And my guitar tech one day went, "Let me build a guitar with this stuff." And I said, "Okay." And it became a guitar that I used for decades because it sounded oh, so cool. huge. It had, yeah, it was a Strat body and or one of those heavy metal necks and just off a of body. And yeah, I played. I used to call it blue. It still is called blue. And um, first gig, it was. One of those moments in sound check where the sound man came running up to the stage and went, that guitar you're playing right now, this new thing, I don't know what it is. He says that it sounds huge in the band, like the bottom and the inertia from it, but just the the bark and the top end chime, everything just it sounds so beautiful. So I hate, I didn't like playing it actually, but because everyone said it sounded so great, I kept playing it. <laughs> I just thought, I'm quite, are you gonna, assuming life comes back, are you gonna be touring again? to yeah, promote the record I want to. yeah yeah i'd love to be in a couple sweaty rock and roll rooms so god that would be awesome want to. we all want to do that yeah yeah but who knows when i know the whole thing is uh and, 
and gear wise, I love my paddles. You know, I don't want to talk about that, but it's a, I would like to make mention of Dave Phillips from LA Sound Design in, in Los Angeles. He built a couple boards for me and he's, he's pretty ridiculous. And I have a setup that I just love. I'm a big fan of the, the Van Muren stuff, the Van Muren Jan Ray. And I have the their version of the Tube Screamer too that they just put out, which is rare. And I have number 12. Number 12 or 11 or 13. Yeah, what, do you, what do you play through, studio and live? Uh, yeah. Okay, yep. J, old JCM 800, two 4 by 12 boxes, old 4 by 12 <laughs> boxes, with green, green backs in it. And I have a JMP as a spare. I have a Roy Blankenship sort of plexi. And I just bought a Morgan JS12 that I love. Joe Morgan never, from I like Nashville, I think. More, yeah, Morgan, Morgan amps, yeah. uh, Morgan amplification. It's a, just a combo amp at the size of the cabinet and just class A, you know, no, no preamp, just class A hand wired. I just wanted a smaller amp and it's kind of just big enough that it lights up the room without pissing off the neighbors. And it just sounds beautiful. See, Americans don't care about pissing off neighbors. Well, as a matter of fact, truth be told, they just sold the house next door and I was <laughs> checking out the, I was checking out who is, who is going to be my potential neighbors. And I have my, my library downstairs right now because of COVID and it's all set up. So I saw some people and when I thought, well, I don't want them to live the next door. I go downstairs and I blast. Right, over the right on, man. And then 10 minutes later, I see the people standing outside by their car talking to the real estate agent, mouthing things like, I can't live next door to that. <laughs> this is a nice house. Horrifying. <laughs> man, you can make some residual income. You can tell the real estate agent, hey, listen, <laughs> you want me to be quiet for showings. You know, it's going to cost you. <laughs> Uh, tell me your top three Desert Island discs. No particular order and just for now. Okay. Uh, um, I'm going to pick um, uh, Casey Musgraves. Mm -hmm. Slow burn. I'd have to pick Electric Lady Lynn, Jimi Hendrix. Great record, man. And uh, Shiny Beast by Captain Beefheart, the one with uh, Bat Chain Puller on it. It's one of the most, it's one of the bravest albums ever. I find musically because I saw him play in a bar in Toronto here years ago. And another fantastic musical experience that just transcended me into nobody does that. Nobody. Be far. No, no one, no one ever did anything. Nobody does that. And nobody yeah. did it. And, and uh, that's maybe where I early on got my, sort of what I want to do, which is own your own piece of musical real estate. I don't want to chase a trend. I don't want to I want to find my 12 notes to make them mine. You stay, you stay in pretty good shape. Is that like, do you put effort into, I mean, you're slim, you're always, you know, I watch a bunch of videos. You're always in pretty fit. Is that something conscious? Yeah. Yeah. Do? Some, no, well, a little bit. Sometimes, you know, I try to keep moving. I spent my time, spent my time in a gym here and there and I can't do that right now. Uh, I can't run anymore. I used to run, but, uh, yeah, I'm older and I have a replaced knee. Um, yeah, I work on it a bit. Yeah. And after having been a heart patient, uh, I have plumbing problems and electrical problems, so I have to watch what I eat. But I also live my life. Like if, if I dig, if I see the burger and I want it, I get the burger. Good for you, man. Yeah, you can't. You, and you tell not eating a burger ain't going to put that, you in the coffin, man. Yeah, yeah, I remember Paul Stanley saying, he's like, Oh, it's cholesterol's high. My doctor told me I can't eat ice cream anymore. It's like my favorite. He says, you're talking to the wrong guy, man. I love ice cream. I'll cut down some, but I'm not quitting eating ice yeah. cream. Yeah. You gotta live, man. Gotta live, man. Yeah. Um, tough question. What do you like most about yourself, Kim? Uh, I like my ability. Okay, even though I'm not doing it today, Craig, I, I think I have an ability to... Uh, ask people about their lives and to empathize with them. Um, and I like their story. Uh, I'm interested in their story. My curiosity for human nature. You're a great listener, man. I, you could tell that when you talk to someone, you're a super, I could see why you're good at that because you know, you're a good listener. Fuck man. I think all I've been doing is talking here for way too long. 
<laughs> no, but when you're, no, you could just, you know how you could tell when people are good listeners. You're, no, you're a Thank very you. good listener. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Do you have any hobbies outside of music? Yes. Um, I have a sports car in the garage, a, a German engineered sports car, and I love taking it to the track. And I'm not talking about a circular track or a drag strip. I'm talking about a real Grand Prix track that goes up and down and around. Really? Uh, yeah, I love, I love, there's a group of people who do that. And it's a beautiful thing. It gives me, oh, it's just the focus that it takes. And, you know, the first year I did it, you have an instructor beside you all the time. And you have to, you know, you have flag marshals everywhere watching your every move. There's strict rules for doing this. You don't, there's not racing. You're not racing against the clock. <laughs> uh, How fast do you go? Um, well, <clears throat> I want to watch what I say because insurance companies might be listening. Um, like hypothetically, how fast might you want to go? Hypothetically, one hypothetically one might. You know, well, it's a track with curves and stuff like that. So it's a, it's first of all, it's about driver development. I find I'm a better driver on the road. First of all, I don't speed on the road. Right. You know, rarely because I get to take it out on the track, where it's it's monitored. It's you're safe. It's, it's I feel like it's pretty safe anyway uh, hypothetically oh you know 240 kilometers an hour 250 sometimes so what is that in and miles so, like uh, 100? Um, well 160 is is uh 160 kilometers is 100 miles an hour oh my god man that is you can't i i once had a, an opportunity to drive like really for me what was fast like 100 miles that is not for the faint of heart, man, you really got no, it. It's not. Yeah, we're, it's, we're not doing that all the time, though, Craig. It's it's it's. There's a back straight on this one track that you you drop your shoulders, you can push your push your foot right down, and 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 you don't hang on tight. You just but but the focus. What I love the most, man, is the focus it takes. It's one of the most exhausting things. By the end of the day, you are done. You yeah, are done. It, it's beautiful. Wow. I just love it. That's, that's my little hobby. That's awesome. Very cool. That's a, a maybe you're only the first or second guy that does something like that, that I've spoken to. Two more questions, Kim, and I can't thank you enough for all your time. Uh, funniest thing that's happened to you on the stage or in the studio? <laughs> and you might've shared it already, but. Uh, no, no, I was on stage once and, and, the end of uh, a song called rock and roll duty. It's a big one of those big bashy rock endings. And I took a step back and hit a hit a crevice in the in the stage and started going really fast backwards. Oh uh, man. On an angle and could couldn't couldn't recover. Ended up smashing into my amps and this is a sold out night too. <laughs> smashing into my amps, the JCM eight hundreds going over, the cabinets go over, everything. And I'm on my back. And uh, what makes it funny is that it all seems in slow motion as it's happening. And my bass player, my first name is Joe, Joseph Kim Mitchell. And he calls me Joe all the time. He always has. And, you know, security, uh, everybody's running up on stage try, trying to pick me up. And he just comes over and looks at me and goes, Joe, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, where are you going? That's yeah. great. So cause I'm, here, I'm looking up at him and, and the audience is kind of where was there. where there's was no, this? there's no oh, it's a town called ballet it was like a resort actually it's a, a wooden resort wooden pavilion resort where they used to have big bands play and there's an x on the stage that says louis armstrong stood here oh that's cool this in, it's in yeah. canada yeah that's yeah. awesome very but cool man sort of a cottage resort so i mean there's always funny laughs along the way we we we, we always laugh at what we laugh at are the guys who in our band who do the Lammy violation, which is you're wearing your laminate pass like in an airport or in a mall or whatever. It's like, no, that's a Lammy violation. You're not supposed to wear your Lammy at the gig. So we'll walk up the guys, you know, cause you see bands at airports like, dude, right. 
Lanny violation. <laughs> <laughs> you're po you're posing. Yeah. You're posing. <laughs> you take your take your take your uh, thing off. Oh, That's what are you? What are you? Drum tech for some big band? That's so, is, that, is that what you find it usually is? Oh, oh it's totally, it's always yeah, like yeah. a C player a, or like the yeah. yeah no. That's funny. Yeah, because you'd figure the main guys don't want to be nobody. They they don't they get recognized enough. The last thing they want is more adulation outside of the gig. Well, a lot of times the main guys are in a private yeah. lounge and section, but so we go up and bust their ass all the time. Lammy violation. Lammy, that's right, man. <laughs> hey, last question. Uh, sure. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much has been a part of aging? Uh, I think most of it's been aging. Pain-free days are over. I'm 60. I just turned 68. So um, You're 68? I, yeah, I don't feel Holy it. Holy shit, man. It. But uh, now you don't look yeah. it either. <laughs> I would have I pegged you for at least 90, Kim. Um, no, that's, I figured you, no, I'm 56. I thought you were like maybe three or four yeah. years older than me. That's awesome, Thank man. You. Holy shit. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, how have I changed? Um, man, that's, that's a tough question. I, I saw, I, I don't know. I, I don't know, Craig. I think I'm, kind of the same person um i feel a little bit more like i'm one of the muppets up in the up in the balcony bitching <laughs> you, know? you become you a know? curmudgeon uh, there's a little bit of that I, there's 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 a uh, two three times a week i have a, an older dude i call and we get on the phone and we bitch and complain about all kinds of stuff and it's just kind of funny it's a, it's all in we laugh at it actually He's, he makes me laugh when he does it um okay what am i um I just, I think I'm, I think I'm maybe a more kind, aware person, uh, less, it's less about me. Um, I think I'm a good father, uh, to my kids, you know, I can, you know, marriage ended pretty early and I put in my time, um, no, I've changed in the last 10 years. Uh, I, I give less of a shit. You know, I think we have to. Uh, we owe it to ourselves to give less of a shit. And I don't mean I don't care about what's going on in the world. I really do. And um, But it's, you know, you kind of realize you know, you're just kind of handing the baton. That's what I love about it. people are like, well, what do you think about the new music and how, you know. I'm like, I love the way each generation comes in and changes it and says what they want to say in their own way. Um, I love that. I may not buy the records of such and such, but I totally respect what they're saying and how they're saying it, like the way they have to say it to reach their audience. That isn't really answering your question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> how many apologies have we had here? We may have a Canadian record with you, Kim Mitchell. Um, listen, man. <laughs> No, you answered my question. You, you're like less concerned what others think of you, basically, is what I think you, you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in this day and age when, when you can be affected by that by looking online and, and, and you just have to give less of a shit and walk with a little more confidence, um, care about the things that are important, my family, and, and, uh, and enjoy the – I think a big change, too, is enjoying the good earth. and the beauty of all that, where you can find it. Um, that's what I try and do. Right on, man. Hey, listen, uh, I cannot thank you enough for your time and for being so sincere. Thank you, Craig. You've been, uh, you're, uh, you were so honest when I spoke to you the first time I knew this would be a good, honest as in like real. And I really appreciate that. Um, let me tell people what you got going on. And, um, it's Kim Mitchell. The new album is called The Big Fantasize. It'll be out sometime before the end of the year. I think Kim will come back on the show once it comes out, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the record. Uh, in the meanwhile, he has a single out called Wishes. It is a beautiful song. I'd love you to check it out, and you can find it on kimmitchell.ca for Canada. Um, also, his YouTube uh, sign up, you know, subscribe to his YouTube channel. Um, follow him on Facebook and Instagram. It's all under Kim Mitchell and under Twitter. It's the Kim Mitchell. And the name of the record again is the big fantasize. 
And uh, we'll all look forward to coming. Man, the, the record's really, really pretty. I'm so happy for you. And thanks again. Thanks, uh, anything thanks. else that I missed or you want to plug or anything? No, man. This has been a good hang, Craig. Thank um, you. I really appreciate the work you're doing, man. And, and I, I wish you a lot of success. Thank Maybe you very much, man. Have. We'll see and, you in uh, I hope you get to talk. I hope you get to talk to Brother Wayne Kramer. I hope so too, man. Like I said, I have his wife's yeah, number. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I'm not. I can't keep calling his wife though. I'm not like that. Um, <laughs> it would be kind of weird. Uh, man, thank you. Hang on one second. Let me All say right. everybody. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We do appreciate your support. Please check out. Uh, many thanks to Kim Mitchell, and please check out KimMitchell.ca his website. Uh, Gear up for the big fantasize when it comes out and follow him on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and uh, I'm just wanna, sorry, I want to make sure I got everything here. And uh, don't forget, man, especially nowadays, most important, please remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Kim, thank you so much for everything, brother. Let's see you, man.